So good evening, everyone. I apologize for the, the late start. And uh, unfortunately, we're having some uh, Wi-Fi issues here at the library tonight. So I'm joining you on my cell phone. Um, we're going to make this work, though. Uh, really excited. I'm going to give it another 15, 20 seconds, let everyone file in from the, from the waiting room. Uh, for those who are with us, uh, feel free in the chat to let us know where you're joining us from tonight. So certainly no obligation, but if you're comfortable doing so, uh, let us know in the chat uh, where you're coming from tonight. Um, uh, I, in general, I wanna thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library. Uh, Joseph is, is um, providing this program free of charge tonight, but in general, I wanna thank the friends for sponsoring all our programs here at the library for adults, teens, and kids. We're a very active programming library and it's thanks in large part to the friends and their generosity. Um, just so folks are aware, we. You're in webinar mode, so Joseph and I cannot hear you or see you. Um, we um, ask that if you have questions or comments, you type the questions into the Q&A and the comments into the comment box or the chat box, and we'll make sure to get to everything at the end of Joseph's presentation. Uh, I anticipate uh, this program lasting approximately an hour. Uh, oh, I should also mention that even though we can't see you or hear you, uh, just know that we are recording this presentation, um, so just so you are aware of that. Uh, unfortunately, because I'm on my phone, I don't have Joseph's uh, extensive uh, bio in front of me, but uh, really pleased to have him tonight. Uh, Joseph is the uh, city archaeologist uh, for Boston. Uh, he's uh, written uh, two books, and he's here to discuss his brand new book that I believe just came out this week or perhaps last week, um, Boston's uh, 10 Oldest Buildings and Where You Can Find Them. Hopefully I got that right. So close. let's give a yeah. big virtual, close enough, there you go, I'm doing this from memory. Let's give a big <laughs> virtual round of applause to Joseph for um, joining us here tonight. And Joseph, you can take it away. Thanks so much. All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Um, thank you, Robert, for all the work that went into getting this up and running. I'm going to start screen, uh, my share screen now. Um, go for it. If I can, there we go. Click the wrong button. I think I know how to do this after like 15 months, but here we go. There we go. Um, so, uh, whoops, one last thing I need to do. So, all right, so I'm Joe Bagnum, City Archaeologist of Boston. Um, I'm sure already you're starting to wonder why is an archaeologist talking about old buildings. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but tonight I'm talking about my, my latest book, Boston's Oldest Buildings and Where to Find Them, which came out last month. Um, this is uh, preservation month in uh, most of the country, but definitely here in Massachusetts. Um, and so we, we kind of kept it secret that this book came out until the beginning of this month so that we could officially launch it um, in May, which is preservation month in Massachusetts. Um, so ultimately this book is celebrating the 50 oldest buildings in the, in the city of Boston. Um, some of which I guarantee you've heard of, and some of them I guarantee you've never heard of, because I never heard of them either. Um, I wanted to start the talk tonight by thanking the folks at the Brandeis University Press, especially Sue Raymond, the president, um, Lillian Dunach, the pr uh, press coordinator, the amazing editors there, and our beta readers, um, Jennifer, Jean, and Lori, who did a ton of work looking at this book in its earliest format. It's actually a much longer format. It was 15,000 words longer when I turned it in the first time, um, but uh, they, they really produced a gorgeous book. Um, this is an example of what the interior of the book looks like. Um, so the book is available now. I'll post a link at the very end of the talk um, to Brandeis University Press's webpage for it, where, which also links to how to get it directly from the publisher, how to buy it from a local independent bookstore, which is really important, um, and also the link to Amazon. Um, if you're local to the Boston area, I saw in the chat that many of you are from Tewksbury, uh, many of the local bookstores have it in stock. I heard that uh, definitely it's in uh, Braintree, which I know is on the South Shore, but if it's in Braintree's Bar Barnes and Noble, that means it's probably in most of the regional Bar Barnes and Nobles at this point. So um, you should be able to get your hands on it. For the folks, I saw a few folks from California, that's really exciting. Uh, probably don't have it in your local bookstore, but you can definitely get it online. Um, as you can see in some of these examples, the uh, visuals from the book really are something else. Um, we're really fortunate here in Boston to have just unbelievable resources um, for historic photos. And that's really made this uh, book come alive. Um, and the folks at Brandeis created a gorgeous book uh, from the printing quality to the weight of the paper. When you hold this book in your hands, you'll be pretty impressed. I certainly was. Um, that's not tuning my horn, believe me, because I didn't have anything to do with the quality of the book at the end. Um, so the book itself has four main goals. Um, the first one I want to celebrate and tell an interesting story. I'm an archaeologist and my, my whole shtick is um, it's not about the stuff, it's about the story. 
So my goals are to tell an interesting story. And I also want to um, educate the general public about preservation efforts, especially the landmark dem and demolition laws here in Boston. I know many of you are not local to Boston tonight, but I think it's important for you to understand what kind of rules and regulations there are in, in the city of Boston, which is known throughout the world as an historic place, um, to see just kind of what the, the good, the bad, and the ugly is about our historic preservation laws, and that there really is um, quite a bit of challenges within our system for how to preserve historic buildings in Boston. Um, I also wanted to prepare. Um, only six of the buildings in this whole book are landmark designated, and I make a strong argument for why landmark designation is kind of the key to preservation in these areas. Um, and my goal is to have each of the chapters in this book, there's 50 chapters for the 50 oldest buildings, um, to kind of create the background story for why each of these buildings is significant so that the ones that aren't landmarked can hopefully be landmarked based just on some of the research that I did. Um, last but not least, uh, it's a fundraising opportunity. I'm a city employee, I'm a public employee, which means I'm not allowed to uh, make money independently of, off of my work uh, as a government employee. Um, so what that means is I can write the book, but I can't take any of the money from it. So I've turned over all of my royalties for the author proceeds. Um, I don't get a nickel from, the, from this book. Um, got to get paid to write it, so I'm fortunate there. But uh, if you buy the book, know that the money that I would normally get from the cost of, of the sales of that book goes back to the Landmarks Commission in the city of Boston for our outreach and education efforts. Um, so I work for the Boston Landmarks Commission. I'm one of the staff. Um, th we're part of the Environment Department for the city of Boston, and we're a staff of dedicated preservationists directed by Roseanne Foley, who's the Director of Historic Preservation and the Landmarks Commission. Um, and our jobs are basically to work to preserve, protect, and promote the city's historic resources above in the sense of buildings and below ground in the sense of archaeology. So I wanna lay down a couple of groundwork um, things for uh, significance and some of the challenges that we have with, um, with people's understandings of what can actually protect a building. So many people think that if a building is listed on the National Register, which is a fairly popularly wide known thing, um, that that alone gives it protections. But the reality is National Register is predominantly a honorific um, designation. It means that the building is significant, but it doesn't necessarily come with a lot of protections unless there's federal funding or permit or um, licenses involved with the project. At that point, there's some protections in place. But basically, if you have a National Register listed building and an owner wants to tear it down, just being on the National Register doesn't inherently cause it to be protected. It can still be torn down. It can still be heavily modified. It can still be painted neon purple. Who cares? Um, but it's not it's not significant in that sense. It's, it's significant in the national or state or local level, but it's not protected. Um, and then the National Historic Landmarks, which there's quite a few in Boston. In fact, I think Massachusetts has the most in the second most National Historic Landmarks in the country. Um, National Historic Landmarks sound like a really important thing, but and they are, um, but the protections are the same as National Register. It's just a National, national Register listing that's nationally significant. Um, compare that to a local landmark. Uh, for those of you in Tewksbury, you have a local landmark a district uh, commission as well. Um, I'm gonna talk about Boston Landmarks Commission tonight, but know that there's a version of this in Tewksbury as well. Um, so local landmarks, a designated local landmark is uh, done by the municipality itself. Um, in, the, in this case, it's the Boston Landmarks Commission. There's various names for the various commissions in, in different towns. Um, in Boston, we require above local significance. And I'm gonna keep coming back to that because it really is a high bar. The building and the story of the building or the people in the building have to have contributed something to the history of not just the city of Boston, but the region or the state or the country in order for it to be landmark eligible. That's a really high bar to set because say a famous sign that's famous in the town is not necessarily famous in the state and therefore may not be significant enough. So those are the kinds of challenges that we have. But if something is landmark designated, all the changes to the interior and to the exterior of these buildings um, are reviewed and determined whether the changes are appropriate, um, regardless of the source of the funding or who owns the building. So these really are the highest level of protections available to buildings. So if you want a building that's historic to remain historically accurate or, or visually um, similar to, the, to its historic significance, you need that local landmark designation in order for it to be protected. 
So in the city of Boston, there's a map here showing um, just downtown and some of the neighboring uh, neighborhoods. It's not the whole city, unfortunately. Um, we couldn't fit it in it because we have a very tall, narrow um, city. Uh, in the, on this map, the red properties are individually landmarked properties. And of course, because the parks are gigantic in, in Boston, um, the parks stand out quite a bit on this map, Franklin Park, uh, Boston Common. Um, but if you look closely, you'll see little red dots kind of throughout the city of individual buildings and properties throughout the city that are individually landmarked. We also have in the blues um, districts, uh, Back Bay, South End, Beacon Hill, areas that are very large collections of buildings that are together significant. Um, but altogether, we have nine, or sorry, over 8,000 properties in Boston have been formally landmark designated. Um, but we also have many more pending landmarks, um, including areas in the North End um, and downtown Roxbury, which is almost in the center of this image, um, that are in the process of becoming landmarks. At least Roxbury, we're actively doing um, the process now. Uh, North End started in, my, I think, the 80s, and it kind of fizzled out. So it's still a pending landmark, but it hasn't actually gotten over the, over the hump of becoming a landmark. Um, but we do also have, uh, the, in the landmarking process, we also have a process that, that kicks in if a building is being threatened to be demolished um, called the demolition delay. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so here's the, the old historic garden building being torn down in, I think, the early 90s. Um, I, I think a significant historic loss. I think many people that love the building um, were sad to see it go. Um, but these are the rules that are in place to help protect buildings. So we have an, a zoning code called the Article 85. We're going to get into the weeds a little bit because, again, this is this is how we protect these buildings. And with nine of the, with only six of these buildings landmark designated, it may come down to the point where the demolition the demolition delay may be the only thing that helps save these buildings if the current owners of buildings in this book want to tear them down. So um, this process is triggered when someone seeks a demolition permit, and we have to determine as a staff if the building is 50 years or old and if it's significant. Um, if it's significant, we require the fundamentally significant, basically does it stand a chance of being landmark designated? If that's the case, then the building, uh, the person that wants to demolish the building has to hold public meetings and present um, alternatives to the demolition. What if they kept the building? What would, be they, what would they do instead of tearing it down? And that's meant to make the developer at least consider possible options to not tearing down the building before they just go ahead and tear it because it, it shouldn't be quite that easy to just tear down the oldest buildings in Boston. Um, at the end of that process, they bring all those alternatives, alternatives to the Landmarks Commission, which is a group of, of um, volunteers, um, some uh, designated by the mayor, some designated by uh, local organizations, and they hold a public hearing where anybody can attend, and they have to over uh, review the alternatives and make a final decision as to whether or not the building is landmark eligible. Um, and uh, if, if they think it could be landmark eligible, they can, they, uh, can invoke a 90-day demolition delay. And that gives a 90-day period to hopefully have the developer choose to do the alternatives and or um, it gives us time to designate the building as an actual landmark because that can take quite a bit of time. What we have to do is uh, do an, a, a study that determines whether or not it truly is above local significance. We reach out to the community to find out if there's additional stories that people know about these buildings. Um, and if, but unfortunately, if the, if the buildings are not above local significance, which sometimes it's just an old building, that's really cool, but it's not above local significance, it's not landmark eligible. If the Landmarks Commission has determined that it's not landmark eligible, after those 90 days, these buildings can be torn down. So um, because of that really high bar, we lose quite a few buildings that are historically interesting, historically beautiful, but because they're just not significant enough, we can't protect them. So um, it's one of the it's one of the, the problems with the system is that um, that above local significance is really a, a sometimes too hard of a bar to get over. Um, I have a ton more information about historic preservation, landmarking, demolition delays um, into the, in the introduction of the book. And at the end of the book, I, I have information about how you can get more involved with your local organizations, regardless of where you are in the country. Um, but tonight, since, since we're going to be mostly talking about the buildings, uh, hopefully, um, I'm going to lay down a couple of ground rules. So when I started the research for this building, I realized that I had um, a, a challenge, which was that I had a lot of potential buildings and a lot of other structures in the city. And I needed to have some ground rules in order to, to decide what buildings go into this, um, into this book. So 
here's the ground rules for the book itself. Um, the building has to be a structure with both roof and walls. Um, and so, and technically a building is anything built by a human. So something like a stone wall or a staircase or a fish weir from Boston uh, Back Bay 3000 years ago. Um, those, are, those are technically buildings, but they're not buildings in the sense that anybody picking up this book would expect. So I wanted to make sure that the buildings, when you open the book on 50 buildings, they look like buildings. So roof and walls, that was the first requirement. Also, it must be located within the current boundaries of Boston. Uh, Boston actually was much larger at one point, then it shrunk down to much smaller than it currently is, and it's now actually grown a little bit since then. So there's areas like the town of Winthrop that used to be within the city of Boston that have now been annexed as their own town, and there's buildings in there that would have been built in Boston when they were built, but are no longer in Boston. So they must be above the foundations. I did that specifically because I'm an archeologist and we dig up old foundations all the time. Um, and if we counted basements, then we would dig up new um, oldest buildings all the time in Boston. And I wanted to have it be kind of more structurally above the foundations. Um, it must be currently visible. Um, sometimes buildings have been completely encapsulated by later buildings. Um, and since most of this project was done during COVID and simply because I, I can't just barge into people's houses and start looking around at old timbers, um, I wanted to make sure that the buildings that were included in the book were at least confirmable from the exterior of the building. Uh, it must be on land. No offense to the USS Constitution, but I wanted to not include boats in the book. Um, it must be used by living humans um, or for human living humans. Um, that I did specifically because I realized that all of the tombs in the graveyards were technically roofs and walls and little houses or little dead houses, but still. Um, and I wanted to eliminate those from the book as well. So when you open the book, you didn't see 45 tombs and five old houses. Um, and the elements must be arranged in approximately the original form. I uh, specifically included that because there's a house called the Capen House that was built in Dorchester, now a neighborhood of Boston, but at one time it's old house in the early 1600s that was dismantled and moved to the town of Milton and rebuilt and then later dismantled again. But instead of rebuilding it, it got put into storage. And right now, if that building was taken out of storage and put back into Boston, it would automatically become one of the oldest buildings in Boston. But I didn't want to include it because um, it's not, I don't even think it's stored in Boston right now and um, it's disassembled. So I didn't think that that really was within the spirit of the book, but I'd love to see the Cape and House come back. Um, in the back of the book, I have honorable mentions that are the, the rule breakers that I thought were still really cool. And one of them is the Cape and House. So I have photos of that house, the way it looked when it was current, when it was standing. Um, if you wanna see that building, I'm not gonna include it in tonight's talk. Um, for research, I uh, cannot stress enough um, how important the, the two, these, this resource is on, uh, online for Massachusetts residents. The Massachusetts Cultural Resource Information System, it's called MACRIS. It's the state's files for all of the historic buildings in Boston. This is where I started my research. On the left is the um, search by address. On the right is the MAPS version of it. Um, I can put a link at the end uh, for folks who may want to, to, to browse it. It's, uh, it's a little bit addictive, um, but it's a way to find out historic buildings in your area or other parts of the state and click directly into um, inventory forms like this one on the right that tell us more information about what's already known about the building. So if you have an historic home and it's in Macris, you can read up about your building, see some of the owners. Um, and that's what I did to start this research. Unfortunately, this is an example of one of the buildings in the book, number 36, the 36th oldest building in Boston, Elijah Jones's house in, in uh, Mattapan, my favorite building in the whole book. Um, but unfortunately, the form was really scant on information. So it has this cover letter that essentially just says this is a state file and this kind of yellowish form that is really the nuts and bolts of all of the information that's known about it. And all it really says is it's probably pretty old and it's on a couple of maps. We don't know what it's called. So it doesn't have a name. It didn't have any historic information about it. It just said looks pretty old essentially. So I had to do all the research from scratch on this property, going through deeds, going through probates, digging through a lot of primary documents in order to find out that Elijah Jones had built the house um, in the 1780s. And, um, and so that's all brand new information. I even got a chance to name the house, which was kind of fun. Um, but uh, that's, that's one of the challenges with this book. I'd say about 20 to 25 of the buildings in this book was um, original research. Um, the other thing that was really surprising about this book was just how many neighborhoods of Boston were included. This isn't strictly downtown or North End, some of the more historic areas along the Freedom Trail. The neighborhoods of Boston are really heavily represented in this book. And if you wanted to go and check out all 50 of these buildings, you're gonna get a heck of a tour of the city of Boston and its, out, and its surrounding neighborhoods. 
Um, uh, I was really surprised to see four buildings in Brighton, Alston. Um, Alston, Brighton, they're, um, they're some of the earliest buildings actually are out in that neighborhood, um, which started off as part of Cambridge. Um, my neighborhood of Mattapan down on the southern part of the city was, is well represented. Um, even Roslindale had a really old house in there. So really shocked to see just how spread out these oldest buildings are. And um, any building, any book that's similar to this one that was done, um, typically they were written in the 19th century. So there's a lot of buildings in those books that are gone now, um, but they never look at the neighborhood. So they never do a holistic approach to this whole city of Boston and be inclusive of its neighborhoods. And that's a really important thing to me. So um, where do we come from? Uh, the historic preservation movement in Massachusetts, again, this is preservation month in May, um, started in uh, with the loss of a building. And that tends to be how you'll see kind of a theme going on throughout this talk of, of loss leading to results. Um, the John Hancock building, which was built on top of or near the top of Beacon Hill by today's State House, was built in 1735 for Thomas Hancock. Um, ultimately, it passed on to his nephew, John Hancock, of everything famous in uh, Revolution War era. Um, but when John Hancock died, he was intending to have the house passed to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but he never wrote it down in his will. So essentially, the ownership of the house was in jeopardy because nobody really knew where it should go. Um, the state was going to buy it, but that ultimately fell through. And then in 1863, um, it was sold at auction and, um, and was, was, uh, was the, the new owners wanted to tear it down for two row house buildings and essentially tried to give it away for free so long as somebody moved the building. Um, that didn't work. And so by 1863, they were about to demo the building and um, local residents created this massive poster on the left. It's like two, but it's about three foot by four foot. It's a really big piece of paper that basically begs the, the, the community to save the Hancock house. It didn't happen. Um, the building got demolished. Parts of it were saved, but not the whole thing. The stairs got moved off to Jamaica Plain. They're now in. They're now next to Jamaica Pond. Um, uh, so the the outrage over the loss of this building, which nobody could believe that we couldn't save in 1863, is credited with sparking the preservation movement in all of New England, um, and it's one of the earliest preservation movements to come out of anywhere in the country. Uh, but that was soon tested. In 1872, Boston had a massive fire called the Great Fire uh, that started in downtown Boston and spread almost to the edge of, um, uh, of what's now our financial district. Um, what you see in the middle photograph is just how close it got to Old South Church. The fire just decimated the, that neighborhood, um, leaving behind almost no standing buildings. And Old South was uh, meeting house was just on the edge of the fire. And that year, the, Bos uh, the people of Boston climbed on top of the roof of the church. You can see it on the left. Um, and laid wet blankets on top of it and sprayed water on the building to try to stop the thousands of burning embers that were landing on it from catching the building on fire. So the community really rallied to protect the building. Well, just four years later, um, or actually two years later, the congregation decided to move out of Old South um, into a new church in Back Bay called the New Old South, um, and then sold the building for scrap in 1876 with a 60-day order to demolish the entire building um, so that a new building could be put up in its place. Uh, the people of Boston were quite upset and started to rally in uh, protest of having it be torn down. And you can see some of the signs that were put on the outside of Old South and this um, zoomed in version of it. So basically the people of Boston rallied to save this building knowing how they lost the Hancock Manor just a couple of years before. Um, so there was a massive rally uh, inside the church. A clothing manage, uh, merchant and his son bought rights to stop the demolition for seven days. Um, during that meeting, uh, speakers and crowds raised over $400,000 to, to try to save the building. But ultimately, it was saved by a group of 20 Boston women who formed the Old South Association and then raised even more money and borrowed additional funds uh, to save the building and buy the land and the building in October of 1876. And it's credited as the first historic building in New England to be saved for preservation. And I'm actually gonna end with a quote by, by William H.H. H. Murray, the guy whose quotes on the upper right, um, when he was standing in Old South, kind of giving a passionate plea to the people of Boston to save these buildings. Because I think it really rings true even to today. So fast forwarding a hundred years, um, by the mid 1970s, 100 years after the saving of Old South, uh, people started to realize that Boston didn't have that many protections in the city at all. Um, by that time, the mid 70s, over 70 cities in the country had landmarks commissions and Boston still didn't have one. So there was nothing really in place to uh, protect these historic buildings from being destroyed unless if the owners wanted to, to tear them down. 
Um, so there's an op-ed in the Boston Globe in 1974 that says, quote, part of, the, part of the problem seems to be that no one realizes that there actually is a problem because Boston happens to be lucky enough to have a lot of good old buildings still around. Many people assume that someone must be keeping an eye on them. Well, no one is. So the next year in 1975, an architect named Leslie Larson formed the City Conservation League to fight demolition of this building, the Jordan Marsh building from 18, uh, built in the 1860s. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to save the building and this gorgeous piece of commercial architecture was demolished. Um, and there's now a, a, a modern thing there. Um, but uh, uh, the result of the, of the outrage over the de demo of the Jordan Marsh building was the state legislature uh, passing the Boston Landmarks Commission in 1975. So again, loss leads to preservation. And unfortunately, sometimes when we lose these kinds of buildings, um, well, unfortunately, we lose these kinds of buildings, but what can be done is these massive losses and these great losses can be used as the pivot point for better preservation. And some it's like one good thing to come out of these losses is the preservation, hopefully. All right, so um, for those of you who happen to be on multiple talks, I don't know if any of you have been to one of my previous ones about this book. I'm actually doing a unique set of buildings for each one of my talks, there may be some overlap with the buildings, but it's a different group of buildings each time I, I give a presentation. Um, so I'm having a little theme with each one. Yesterday I did all the buildings from 1876. Um, today what I decided to do for uh, Tewksbury is the beginning, the middle, and the end. So what I'm gonna show you tonight is the oldest house in Boston, um, the first building in the book, the 25th oldest house in Boston, and the 50 oldest, 50th oldest house in Boston, um, just to kind of show you the range of the types of buildings. And we're going to go to three very different neighborhoods during that process. But we're going to start with the oldest building in Boston, the James Blake House, which was built in 1661. Um, and just it's a really cool piece of medieval Boston, basically. So the James Blake House is Boston's oldest building. It stands within Richardson Park near Edward Everett Square in the northern end of Dorchester, which used to be its own town. Today, it's a neighborhood of Boston just south of downtown. Its dark and boxy rectangular form, its steep roof and park surroundings stand out in contrast to the captive audience of 19th century three-decker apartment buildings that surround it. You can see those in the background of this photo. Long before it arrived at this location, the Blake House sat on a 10-acre parcel of farmland a few hundred feet to the north northwest. This original site is today a parking lot for the Eversource, uh, for a massive Eversource building just west of the South Bay Shopping Center, which you pass on 93 as you go south of Boston. James Blake and his wife Elizabeth Clapp had the house made for them in 1661 on a rel relatively modest lot, for the time at least. At 32 by 20 feet, it's nearly 1,500 square foot interior space across four rooms on two floors. It was actually very large for its time. Similarly aged structures in Boston and the surrounding area were typically built with a large chimney and rooms only on one side of the chimney in the hope of expanding the house in the future on the opposite side of the chimneys. You'll see a lot of these in some really old houses where it looks like the chimney is just on one side with the house on uh, with the entrance on one side. This house started actually with a completely symmetrical full scale as you see in this image. Also different from other buildings of this period was the style of construction. Architectural historians believe that the house rights who built the Blake House were from the southwest corner of England. In that area, trees were far more prevalent, resulting in a, distinctly region, a distinct regional building style that uses liberal use of timbers in the framing of the building and joining detail. These details are found in the Blake House as well. You can see there's quite a bit of wood use in, in the framing of the, of the building itself. Um, other buildings would actually have fewer beams between each of the um, overall. Uh, basically, the, the the area of the southwest of England had more trees and therefore the builders that lived in that area were used to using a lot more trees um, in the construction style of their home. These details are found in um, Blake House as well. Most of the English house rights and other immigrants to New England for, were from East Anglia, the region northeast of London. And so most of the 17th century houses in Massachusetts rest, re reflect this East Anglian style of architecture with smaller timbers used in the framing. In fact, the Blake House is the older of two surviving, quote, West of England style 17th century houses in Massachusetts, the other being the circa 1678 Coffin House, which you can find in Newbury, and I have a photograph on the bottom. The black and white photographs are from the, the building of the uh, Blake House itself. When it was first built, James and Elizabeth would have experienced a slightly different house from what you see today. Hidden in the beams of the roof is the ghost of two front dormers, which would have protruded from out of the roof on the house to increase the livable space in the attic. 
So one of the things I'm really proud of with this book when I wrote it was um, I took a lot of time in Photoshop to do some digital reconstructions of buildings. So what you're actually seeing on the right is my manipulation of, of, of the building digitally to reconstruct what it would have looked like back in the 1600s. And I do that with a, quite a few buildings in this book. So it's one of the unique parts of the books is the visuals that are actually meant to be color reconstructions of these houses from back in the day. Um, and we actually have a last, the last building I'm gonna show you in this talk tonight too, is gonna to have a similar re digital reconstruction. So over the centuries, this house stood on its original location. It received numerous additions. By 1748, the occupants had added a lean-to addition to the left side of the house and the front gables had been removed. So this photo is a, a photograph of the house in the late 1800s, showing all of the different additions that were put onto it. I keep minimizing my window. Um, by 1800, owners added a new addition to the right rear of the house. At some point in the 18th century, the Blakes replaced the three panel diamond pane casement windows that swing on side hinges with double hung windows where the lower sash lifts on hidden weights. These replacement windows can be seen in this historic photograph, um, the six over six style windows, whereas the earlier versions would have had the diamond pane windows. And I'll see that again in a second. The Blake House remained in the Blake family for many generations before the family sold the property outside of the family in 1825. Again, they built it in the 1660s and stayed in the family until the early 19th century. Despite constant use, the house retained much of its original 17th century interior elements, including its original interior doors and hinges. And there's a photograph of one of the original doors on the left. The property remained in an ever decreasing lot until in 1895 when the city of Boston purchased the property to build greenhouses needed for Frederick Law Olmsted's Emerald Necklace, a monumental park and landscaping project. So the map on the right shows the Blake House where it started and where it ended up. And the yellow star on the right on the top shows the Blake House and it's a tiny little lot as it shrunk down. You can see the city of Boston nursery creeping up on it as it's about to be taking over the property. The blue star shows where the house was moved to um, inside of Richardson Park, which is uh, labeled the city of Boston because it was a city park at the time. This area of Dorchester was the southern and easternmost end of Olmsted's series of parks that were intended to encircle Boston in green space called the Emerald Necklace. This also created a big problem. One of Boston's oldest houses was still sitting on the property that they wanted to develop. The Dorchester Historical Society, which had been founded more than 50 years earlier, sought the preservation of the building, resulting in permission from the city of Boston to move the Blake House from its current location onto Richardson Park for their use as a site for, by the society as a museum. This early historic organization was bolstered by the burgeoning arts and crafts movement in American art, architecture, and philosophy. At the end of the 19th century, the movement, inspired by guild trade systems in the Middle Ages, created a new celebration of craftsmanship, handmade products, and human labor, and various other aspects of production that were rapidly disappearing or being replaced by mechanical mass production during the Industrial Revolution. This movement may be co-credited with saving the Blake House as its nearly medieval age and its craftsmanship, coupled with fairly large population of enthusiasts for historic buildings in Dorchester, resulted in the city setting aside a portion of the land within the existing Richardson Park for the house. Richardson Park itself was the location of Dorchester's 17th century town common, a small pond, and the first church at its eastern end. It made, its, it made an appropriate 17th century landscape into which to place one of Boston's few remaining 17th century buildings. In order to prepare the house for moving, several modifications were made to the house and its future home. First, a small pond in Richardson Park was filled with rubbish from the nearby residents in order to create a smooth, flat place for the house to traverse to its new home. Second, the later 18th and 19th century additions to the Blake House were removed as they were not from the 17th century. By the winter of 1895, the house was ready to be moved. The local Dorchester Beacon newspaper stated on December 7th, 1895, that the new foundations in Richardson Park were completed and workers were preparing the landscape of the park for the arrival of the house. Though the newspapers somehow do not actually mention the moving of the house on the day that it was moved, a relatively commonplace event during the 18th and 19th century, um, a, a January 18th, 1896 article states that there was a meeting held in the Blake House in its new location in Richardson Park, providing a six week window for the date of the move. It still blows my mind that nobody mentioned in the local newspaper that the Blake House wandered almost a half mile down the street to a new location. The timing of this move was pre-planned. The winter conditions would have frozen the ground, making it more durable for the move of the considerable weight of the building. Once the house was lifted off its foundation, a sled -like structure would have been built under the building and the house lowered onto the sled and pulled by oxen or horses down the street on long rollers. Standing in front of the house today, which is in this image on the left, 
um, at the intersection of Pond and Cottage Street, you can imagine the house traveling down the street from Massachusetts Avenue on the right, taking the slight bend at Pond Street and slowly man maneuvering itself to its new home aided by dozens of animals and Dorchester residents. Once the Blake House arrived, it underwent a full restoration. As will be seen throughout this book, restorations were all products of their time. Therefore, the 1895 restoration of the Blake House was in fact an arts and crafts interpretation of what the 17th century house restoration could look like. Some of these decisions included the removal of the double hung windows and shrinking them back to their casement windows with side hinges. The current windows are likely smaller in size and number than the three panel windows that are now believed to be the actual original uh, window style when the house is first built. The window glass of the 17th century was typically diamond paint and held together with lead. The 1890s restorers chose to use multicolored Dutch glass in each of the window panes, which was not accurate to the pale olive green glass that would have been used in the 17th century. I've been in this building quite a few times. If you look out the windows, it's, it's completely technicolor. Some of the windows are red, some of them are green, some of them are blue, some of them are orange. It's all the different colors. It's really strange. Um, being one of the oldest house restorations of note in Boston, these efforts themselves have become part of the historic character of the house and are notable parts of the early historic, uh, early history of historic preservation. This is my favorite part of the story. In 2007, the Dorchester Historical Society received a Massachusetts Preservation Funds grant from the Mass Historical Commission to conduct a new restoration of the house. The decision was made to not attempt again to restore the house back to 1661, despite recent developments to the methods and theory of historic preservations, but to restore the house to its 1895 appearance because the rest restorations could be accurately guided by numerous photographs of the house from multiple angles after it was moved into the park. So basically it was the, ease, uh, the most accurate restoration they could do because we have so many visuals of what it looked like in 1895. Though it was known already to be the oldest house in Boston, one of the first and most important studies made of the Blake House during the restoration was dendrochronology dating of a beam in the house. Dendrochronology, or dendro, uses tree rings to date a house's age. The dendro results showed that the trees used in the house were felled in 1661, a little bit younger than the circa 1651 age, the house that was repeatedly was repeated in numerous historic records, though none of these records provide precise reasons to justify the date. Despite the new date, the Blake House managed to retain the, its crown as the oldest house in Boston. The restoration included removing the incredibly heavy slate roof that had been added to the ancient roof beams, replacing the roof and the wood siding on the house with new cedar shingles that are closer to what would have originally been on the house in the 17th century, and repairing the windows. The rule of the 2007 restoration was whatever is in the photos gets put back, which can most notably be seen in a small rectangular trim board between the two front facade windows right of center along the roof line. Some of the reference photos used in the restoration, including the image that you see on the right, uh, show this rather incongruous piece of wood in the trim of the roof line, but nobody to this day knows what the function or purpose of that piece of trim was. Even though it was no longer there in 2007, it was in the historic photos, so back up it went. And on the left, you can actually see a photograph of the restored house with that little piece of trim added back. We still don't quite know what it was for. Since its move in 1895, the first time a house was moved in New England for historic preservation, the Blake House has been the oldest of three houses proudly owned by the Dorchester Historical Society. In the 1970s, it was listed on the National Register and became one of the first individually landmark designated properties in Boston in recognition of its national significance as a rare surviving century home, 17th century home and due to the rarity of its architectural construction techniques. Um, today, it's occupied year-round by a living caretaker who gives free tours of the house monthly, although not during COVID. Um, as it approaches its fourth century in existence, may it forever remain a testament to Boston and Dorchester's colonial past, its historic architecture, and efforts by many individuals that go into preserving the past. All right, we're going to jump to the middle part of the book, to building number 25, the Benjamin Faneuil Gatekeeper's House, circa 1761. Not the most attractive house in the book. Um, so this ga small gambrel roof house is all that remains of the massive 70 acre estate of Benjamin Faneuil. You'll probably recognize the last name because he's the brother of the infamous Peter Faneuil, who's um, associated with Faneuil Hall, obviously, uh, which is the 18th oldest building in Boston. Benjamin and Peter were sons of a French born Huguenot who joined their wildly wealthy uncle, Andrew Faneuil in Boston after their father's death. So they were both raised by their uncle. Come on, there we go. Andrew, a confirmed bachelor, their uncle, offered to include both brothers in his will if they remained single. When Benjamin fell in love with his future wife, Mary, he was cut out of his uncle's life and fled to Europe. While Peter grew wealthy as a well-connected slave trader, Benjamin followed a quieter path. 
In his will, Andrew left the vast majority of his wealth and estate, including the massive mansion you see here, to Peter, leaving Benjamin just, quote, five shillings and no more. It was a pretty big smack in the face for um, Benjamin for getting falling in love, essentially. After Andrew's death in 1738, Peter became the wealthiest man in Boston, having inherited his uncle's wealth and being uh, wealthy himself. But just six years later, Peter died without a will. Because he was, un, was an unmarried man at his uncle's request, the majority of his estate ultimately went to his brother, Benjamin, who would then had the combined fortunes of Andrew and Peter. It was the largest inheritance ever in Boston's history. Included in Peter's estate was five enslaved people. Their ages and genders were not recorded. It is likely that Benjamin became the enslaver of these people, but it is not known if they lived with him in Brighton. Benjamin Faneuil continued his quiet life, purchasing 70 acres for a new family home in the Brighton area of what is now Alston Brighton neighborhood in 1761. After having an older building demolished, he funded, funded the construction of a massive mansion, which is above the yellow arrow, um, and many outbuildings, presumably including the gatehouse that still stands. And you can see it in the photograph under the blue arrow. Though there are few detailed records of the function of this building on the property other than the main mansion. As the wealthiest man in the region, Faneuil was able to garnish his house with the most expensive beans available. One particularly notable aspect of his home was his parlor, whose walls were lined with wood paneling. Each panel was 52 inches wide and consisted of a single board. Benjamin Faneuil moved to Brighton with Mary, his wife, and their three children, Benjamin, Peter, and Mary. It's very hard to do genealogical research on these folks because they're all named the same names. Benjamin Faneuil Sr. would spend the remainder of his life in Brighton, but he experienced some turmoil in his later years. On behalf of Benjamin Sr.'s daughter, Mary, it is said that her manservant, who may have lived in the gatekeeper's house and may have been one of Peter Faneuil's enslaved men, invited General George Washington when he passed by the house to enter the home. There, Mary invited Washington to return um, with General Charles Lee for dinner. Her Tory father, now blind and senile, this is Benjamin Faneuil, unknowingly dined with the men. When he was informed of the identity of his guest, he, co he complimented Washington as a leader, but accused Lee of treason. Mary apologized to Washington and Lee, and it may have been her apology that allowed the property to remain in her family's ownership during and after the revolution, despite the fact that it was owned by a family of Tories. When Benjamin Sr. died in 1786, he left the estate to his daughter and her husband, George Bethune. The property would have remained in the ownership of several wealthy Brighton families until the mansion burned in 1917, and the gatehouse became a separate property. In 1924, the Crittenden Women's Union, recently named Empath, built a large building on the rear of the Faneuil Estate and it remains owned by the organization. The owners play a valuable role in providing services for low-income people trying to reach economic independence. Though the gatekeeper house has had a lean-to added to its back and porch to the front, this early piece of Brighton history retains its overall small scale and 18th century form. In the late 1990s, Brighton residents submitted a petition to the Boston Landmark Commission seeking to make the building a Boston landmark. The property is still a pending landmark as the study report has not been finished. It has no other historic designations or recognitions. It's a nice little historic photograph of the house. All right, we're gonna move on to the last one. So it's actually two, I kind of lied. Um, number 49 and number 50, because we can't talk about one without the other. So it's the Daniel Carter House, circa 1794, and the Samuel Turnpike, sorry, Salem Turnpike um, in 1794 as well, uh, the hotel, excuse me. Um, these are both in Charlestown. So Daniel Carter purchased a lot of open land from Aaron Putnam in late 1794. The lot was across the street from the town training field where the local militia trained before and after the revolution. Carter was a carpenter and it's highly likely that he immediately set about building the structure currently on the site. He built a large late Georgian house, the red one on the right, with five bays along Putnam Street and a hipped roof at the, um, of the period and central doorway that, is, that had, was much altered later. So you can see the house faces on the right in this image. On the common side of the street, the, the property probably had an identical five bay facade, making it a large L-shaped property on a prominent corner in town. It's hard to see how this building would have looked, so let's change that. This is another one of our digital reconstructions. In 1804, Thomas Robbins, an inholder, purchased the Carter House, later expanding the property to, uh, as the demand for lodging increased, adding the dark brown addition on the left. This expansion appears to have occurred in 1805 when Josiah Gurney purchased the adjacent lot on the northeast of the Carter House on Common Street. 
Gurney, a shipbuilder, is probably responsible for building the addition on the property himself, though it is uh, this addition and the portions of the building that were incorporated from the Carter House that have been historically known as the Salem Turnpike Hotel. It is not entirely clear if Gurney operated the hotel independently from Robbins or, as it seems more likely, Gurney and Robbins were business partners. But the building remained a hotel for only a short time, though it's retained its historic name. Basically, we have indications of both of these buildings being owned by innkeepers. The one on the left was known as, as the Salem Turnpike. We're not quite sure if they all together were treated as the Salem Turnpike or just the building on the left, but it would be kind of weird if there was two literally half sharing hotels next door to each other. So we're pretty confident the whole thing was a hotel at one point. Returning to the Red Carter House, by the mid 19th century, the two properties had separate ownership and functions. Though this 1848 drawing of the view from the newly constructed Bunker Hill Monument illustrates this building and the Salem Turnpike Hotel as one continuous building um, nearly a block long. This suggests that the two were still experienced as one structure in the late 1840s. After passing through multiple owners in 1852, James Dubois sold the house to James Sutton and referred to the, uh, documents variably as a cabinet, pump, or block maker at the nearby Charlestown Navy Yard, which in this map you can see in the distance on the left. The Navy Yard began in 1800 as a shipbuilding facility in the newly created U.S. Navy. And by the mid 20th, 19th century, it had become a massive operation attracting well-paid builders um, and specialists who lived in nearby homes a short walk away. The 1850 census from two years prior had the purchase um, includes James Sutton, his wife, Charlotte, and their two children, John and Mary. To supplement his income, James and Charlotte took on borders, including four other families listed in the 1855 census. By 1860, their financial position seemed to improve, the, and that year's federal census records a couple as living in a home with a servant, Emily, and a seven-year-old named Ella Smith, all listed together as a single family unit. The property remained in the hands of the Suttons until the family sold it to William Long in 1879. Of the 20th century, uh, throughout the 20th century, the property remained remarkably intact and unchanged. You can see in this photo from the late 19th century on the left. As Charlestown became home to a diverse community of New Englanders and immigrants, the, the Daniel Carter House um, has managed to stay remarkably intact. Um, the house is not listed on the National Register and it is not a Boston landmark. The National Register lacking is really shocking to me. Um, back to the Turnpike Hotel in 1810, Matthew Rice purchased the house and his family remained its owners throughout the 1900s. Rice was a significant member of the Charlestown community as a foreman of the joiners department in the Charlestown Navy Yard. There he led significant projects, including the finishing and framing of multiple buildings in the Navy Yard, including the landmark designated 1834 Charlestown Navy Yard rope walk. Most significantly, he was responsible for repairs to the USS Constitution, which saw combat throughout the early 19th century and returned to the Charlestown Navy Yard for repairs. In the 1820 census, Matthew Rice was listed with his wife, Sally, and six children, including two boys and two girls younger than 10 and two girls younger than 16. The Rice family would remain owners and occupiers of the property throughout the early 20th century. Like the adjoining Carter House, the Salem Turnpike Hotel survived the 19th and 20th century is in remarkably good condition without any significant changes. Like these, these two buildings just did not change. It's really shocking. Um, though this rare building from the 18th century is not a Boston landmark or listed on the National Register, it is a significant place in Massachusetts, both because it served as a hotel to travelers and because of its association with Matthew Rice. Okay, so those are the three buildings we're going to talk about tonight. And to kind of conclude the, the presentation, um, obviously there's 47 other buildings in the book, and I really highly recommend you find a copy of the book um, or attend more of these meetings um, so that uh, you can see some of the other ones. Um, I wanted to end with a quote from Reverend William H.H. H. Murray. Uh, this was spoken from within the Old South a few years after it was saved from the fire in this photo, um, but while it was actively being planned to be demolished. And so here's some of what he said. What is it that makes Boston, Boston? Do your warehouses make Boston? Do your stores make Boston? Do your miles of wharfage make Boston? Do the white sails of your many ships make Boston? Are these the things that make Boston and are chiefly valuable to it? No, these warehouses, these ships, these mansions, these things of iron and wood and stone are only the body of Boston. They're only the iron nerves along which her interior unseen vital self communicates her will. They're only the flesh in which she is living. But Boston is that unseen something, that immortal, sublime, invisible spirit that is not in this building or that building, but which buildings suggest and advertise to the public. And here in this building, there is value, be that value beyond any material valuation because here Boston has her unseen, invisible, loftiest self suggested and expressed to the public. <laughs>
take away these expressions of the soul of the life of Boston and what I ask, have you left beyond any other city on the continent? So I want to thank you all for joining me tonight. I'm gonna to post a link to the, um, to the book, uh, to how to buy the book in a second on the chat once I stop screening, screen sharing. Um, I also wanted to point out that uh, for the folks that are, are local to Tewksbury, you have both a historical society and an historic district com commission like my Boston Landmarks Commission. Um, so you can get involved with both of those things. Um, either join the historical society who uh, usually are responsible for getting information to the Landmarks Commissions um, or just write an email to your local Landmarks Commission and tell them that they're doing really good work because um, it's a very thankless job sometimes and I'm sure they would appreciate hearing that. Um, if you're interested in purchasing the book, um, I'll post a link, but you can pick it up um, at bookshop.org and indiebound.org, which will buy the book from a local independent bookstore, which is really important to support your local independent bookstores. Um, and you can pick it up obviously on Amazon because it sells everything um, or directly from Brandeis University Press. And the link is coming shortly. I'm gonna turn back on my video and here comes the link. And I hope you all have some questions because I'm really excited to answer some. Great, well, wonderful job, Joseph. Thank you so much for giving us not three, but four homes. And uh, I love the, uh, the quote that you ended with. Uh, I can attempt to recite the questions to you. Thanks. Let's see. Uh, Mike wants, to, so this was back uh, with the first house you were speaking of. Uh, how many trees were there for lumber for buildings in 1661? Yeah, so it depends on where you were. So one of the quotes from the earliest uh, settlers in Boston was commenting on the fact that the town of Boston was great to move into because all the trees were already gone. Um, so the reality was that the native people that had been living in Boston and the surrounding area, they used wood for everything. So the clearing of the woods along the Northeast coast was pretty significant because you need it for um, housing, you need it for firewood, you need it for boats, et cetera. Um, but if you go inland just a little ways, then you have the forest again, which were left intact for, for um, to allow for, for animals to graze. Um, there's quite a few forests. In fact, we have uh, woodlots being mentioned in the 17th and 18th century in Boston, owned by Boston uh, owners. So it's, it's, I think one of the things that people have to understand is that Roxbury, Dorchester, and some of these kind of outskirts of Boston were really rural back then. And many of them were cleared for pasture land. But um, reality was, if you got within a, a couple of miles of a downtown anywhere in the 17th century, you were in the boonies again. So there's, there's lots of forest land. Um, so wood would not have been hard to come by. The difference is really in the architectural style is that we don't have a lot of people learning how to build houses in 1660s who weren't starting off that job in London or the surrounding area. We're importing all of these professionals. So folks that come to Boston to build a house in the 1660s, they're gonna build the house that they were trained in how to, how to build. And so if they came from that kind of more woodsy areas southwest of London, they're gonna build a heavy timber um, house. The folks that came from northeast of London are going to show up and even though there's a lot of trees around the area they know how to make what they know how to make which is a kind of more splintery looking house kind of spindly looking house even though they're really robust they're just smaller trees so there was no lack of wood but the people that made these houses were making what they had in mind for how to um, how to build a house. Uh, Kathy wants to know why was the rule for significance made so hard? That's a good question. It really comes down to a single word. I think it's actually almost a comma. Um, I think the reality was that it was such a challenge to even get the Landmark Commission created that this was considered to be a reasonable kind of middle ground between having a Landmarks Commission that had too much power and having a Landmarks Commission that had no power. Um, so I think that's why the bar was set so high. Um, it's, it's now become a major problem because the, we have such a concentrated culture in Boston where things that are happening in Boston are significant only to Boston, but Boston's kind of the capital of New England. So we're kind of having this challenge now where it may be significant to this one space, but the reality is people know about these things from all around, but the significance doesn't really go out, but it's still, it's still like a, a local landmark. And we, we use that phrase, local landmark, local landmark, but then when we get to this Landmarks Commission, we can't actually landmark designate something that's a local landmark because if it's just a local landmark, it's not landmark eligible. So the irony there is kind of, is, is creating a problem. Um, 
But one of the challenges is if you start to change these rules and regulations, then you suddenly will get developers participating in that conversation who might say, we don't need a landmarks commission. So it could be a bit of a Pandora's box situation. If we wanna make it better, we have to open back up that legislation but depending on what happens at that point, we could end up with no landmarks commission or a much weaker landmarks commission when we're trying to actually make it stronger. So that's that's kind of where we are right now in this kind of challenge of um, trying to come up with creative solutions and determining whether or not we really have the 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 effort behind and the and the community support behind actually making these changes. The other thing we don't want to do: the city of Boston needs to change, it needs to grow, it needs to evolve. Um, we can't put a lid over the city of Boston and say nothing can change anymore. Um, we need to make more room for people. We're a growing city. So it can't be seen as a way to stop progress either because it, it doesn't need to be. There's plenty of buildings that aren't significant that could be torn down. And there's also a lot of land that's, that's vacant that could be built on. So the goal is to not say nothing can change. The goal is to say, don't tear down these old buildings in order to change. Or if you're gonna use an old building, add to the back of it before you tear it down or move the house to another place before you tear it down. There's a lot of really creative solutions to these challenges that people have with these old buildings being on these lots that, um, that we can come up with creative solutions. And one of my biggest things is if, if a developer has to jump through the millions of hoops for uh, zoning code and for building code, which are not easy challenges to meet, if they can meet those challenges and still produce a good looking new building, or at least a relatively good looking building, then they can manage to deal with an old building as well. They can come up with a creative solution and they can address that concern. Um, it's just another thing that they have to deal with. And it should the first thing should not be, we have no other option but to tear it down. It's too hard to deal with it. Uh, so going back to something you mentioned towards the very beginning of your presentation, uh, Teresa wants to know, can you briefly talk about Macris again? Is it a website that anyone can access? Yes, so Macris is 100% open to the public. It's a great website. I'm gonna put a link in the um, chat right now. I'll do the maps version of it so that y'all can get to it. Um, I apologize for the, all the time that you're gonna spend dealing with that and not something else that you need to do, but there's a link to Macris. Um, it's a bit of a time sink. Uh, when you click on the dots, it'll bring you to the form. You click on the form and you can read whatever we have about it. It's not necessarily gonna be a ton of information, but some of these are like small dissertations on these buildings. So um, you can look up your own house if you're in Massachusetts to see if you make it to the list. My house is 1944, it did not make the list, um, but uh, I've got plenty of houses in my neighborhood that did. Great. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, I didn't catch what you said about the role of the mayor for preserving buildings. And would the acting mayor of Boston be, uh, excuse me, would the acting mayor of Boston be able to do these things too? So the acting mayor of the Boston would definitely be able to do um, what they would like to do with this. So basically the, the landmarking process, um, it has to get triggered by, I don't know how many there will be in the end, but let's say three or four things. Um, you get 10 Boston voters to sign a petition to have it be landmarked. You have a single Boston landmark commissioner to um, sign a petition. You have a single city councilor sign a petition or you have the mayor sign a petition. So that triggers the start of the process. Um, so any of those four individuals or groups can actually start the process. Once we get to the point where a landmark has been designated by the Boston Landmarks Commission, which is the group that votes on it ultimately, it then has to get through two final hurdles, which is it has to get ratified by the mayor and city council. And so we've had landmarks such as um, the Sicko sign get through the Landmarks Commission and then get overturned um, at the mayor or the, um, the city council level. So uh, it's a checks and balances situation so that no one group has all of the authority, um, but the mayor is definitely involved with um, the coming and going of landmarks um, and ultimately has one of the three final votes to make a landmark. You have to get the mayor's approval, you have to get city council's approval, and you have to get the Boston landmarks approval. Without those three votes, you don't get a landmark, which is why it's so difficult to do. Um, so uh, I am mindful of the time, but uh, we did start late um, due to me. So uh, we'll go an extra five to 10 minutes here. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, how does the Boston Redevelopment Authority relate to preservation? So uh, the Boston Redevelopment Authority is an independent organization that doesn't necessarily do preservation, although they have a lot of say in kind of the results of what these buildings are. Um, so basically, it's, it's a complicated system that I don't terribly understand because I'm kind of outside of it a little bit and I enjoy being a little bit outside of it to be completely honest, but 
Um, the Boston Redevelopment Authority has a separate independent process that they go through when you want to develop a building or modify a, a landscape or tear down a building. So if you wanted to do that, you would go to the Boston Redevelopment Authority and go through their entire process. What they will do is if there's a building that's 50 years or older, they will say, by the way, you're going to have to go through the landmarking process or at least the Article 85 delay, which is the um, for, for buildings that are 50 years or older. So their role is to make sure that the developer or the property owner knows about the Landmarks Commission so that they're not surprised at the end of this. So think of the BRA or the BPDA, because it's now called, um, think of them as one of the multiple processes that you have to go through. So. BPDA makes big picture plans for the city of Boston, but they don't decide what zoning does. So if you have to do something like build bigger than the zoning code allows, then you have to do the zoning code, um, you have to do a zoning um, appeal. So to get permission to build beyond what the zoning code allows. So like put a three family on a two family lot. Um, and like the zoning code, if you have a building that's 50 years or older, you have to also go through the landmarking process. So they're one of the multiple systems. And what we do as independent groups is say, you're gonna go through us first, but don't forget that they're coming up. And if you can start that process now, because the last thing you wanna do is go through the entire process and then have to go to another one and go back a couple steps and then go back to the original process. So we try to do everything kind of all together um and, but it doesn't always work that way but ideally we're all kind of working together to make sure that the bpda isn't surprised by what the landmarks commission does and isn't surprised by what zoning code does because ultimately it just makes more work for all of us if we say do this and the next one says don't do that go back to the first one yada 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 and that's just within the city of boston if it triggers other rules then you have to go to the state um, uh, massachusetts historical commission there's a lot of other authority things so bpda is is kind of big picture planning um, so for bigger developments, especially, but even BPDA has to defer to Landmarks Commission when it comes to landmark statuses of buildings. Uh, Ryan asks, uh, which oldest building is your favorite or most interesting? Um, I showed you a little bit of it. Um, it's that little building that I had the paperwork next to, the Elijah Jones's house. Um, the reason why it was so interesting to me is because it was such a royal pain in the butt to do the research. Um, to be blunt, what ended up happening was I... I worked back through the do the ownership and I got stuck in, I forget what year it was, I think the early 1800s because I ended up with the Massachusetts General Hospital own, owning it. And I couldn't figure out where the heck Massachusetts General Hospital got the ownership of this building from. Uh, it's in Mattapan, it's in, on the small road. Basically there's no reason for the hospital, the big hospital in the state to own this tiny little house. Um, so I just got completely lost. And so I had to walk away from it three times during the research phase. And finally, it was one of the last buildings I was able to write up in the book because I just was like, I know this building is old enough to make it in the book and I can't figure out who built it. And I was just about to say, I have no idea who built this building, but Mass General Hospital owned it like 50 years later, which is not a great way to describe it. Um, and I had a breakthrough. I ended up doing the research for all the properties around it and got a neighbor that I could then say in his deeds, oh, it's owned by this guy. And so I got, anyway, it's, it's a long convoluted story. It all comes out in the book. You're gonna have to buy the book to get it. I'm um, sorry, <laughs> but- uh, Good tease. Yeah, it was, a, it was a really interesting story with a really interesting group of people involved. Um, and you'll have to read it to find out how Mass General got it. Great, uh, David asks, as an amateur photographer, is there a building or site you think is a must to take? Mm, um, geez, I think that the Shirley Eustis house is one of the prettiest buildings in all of Boston. Um, and uh, the old state house is a challenge because you have so many things going on around it. Um, I took, uh, I, so I went to go take a photograph of that in February during an incredibly cold day on uh, February vacation in 2020. And I went all around the neighborhood taking pictures of these houses. Many of them ended up in the book, um, but there was nobody on the street. And I remember thinking in February, wow, I can't believe how lucky I was to have a chance to walk around downtown Boston where there was absolutely nobody on the streets. And then March happened and I could have done that for the next three months. So I ended up freezing that day, but, um, but they ended up being some really great photos. I went back in April or May to go take night shots of old of the old state house, which is another really fun one to do. I recommend that because um, it's beautifully lit at night. And depending on how you uh, um, what time you take the pictures, you can get some really cool effects of, of blurring lights and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if anybody is interested, but uh, I took every single one of the photographs of the main houses myself with my cell phone. Those are all iPhone pictures that publish. So you don't need a fancy camera to get decent photographs. Um, 
that's saying that they're decent. I think they're decent, but I'm a little biased, obviously. Um, and I don't know. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, some of the buildings just, just when you when you get the book, you'll notice that some of the buildings are just really hard to love visually. They're not the prettiest buildings, and that's kind of one of the challenges of historic preservation. Is what happens when you have a building that's really cool and interesting but doesn't look it. Um, what do you do with that? Because some people think that historic preservation is, is saving all the pretty buildings, but in my opinion, and my colleagues in historic preservation, you're saving the important stories. You're saving the things that actually tell us something interesting about the past. And that doesn't mean it's necessarily the prettiest looking buildings. Um, but as, as somebody who was interested in making a pretty looking book, I got to some of these houses and I'm staring in front of them going, I don't know how I'm going to make this one look nice. Um, some of them are, have big additions on the front of them. So it was hard to even see the actual building. I had to kind of like wander around and not, you know, trespass on people's properties. Um, there's one in Dorchester that you basically can only see a bit of a chimney in a corner of a building um, total in the entire photograph. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I hope that answered it a little bit, but um, that was my attempt. <laughs> Well, uh, speaking of trespassing, uh, Deb wants to know, uh, being an archaeologist, if an old building was going to be taken down, would you have any control over digging in the yard for artifacts? So one of my little hidden secrets about this whole book is that um, my jurisdiction as city archaeologist is really based on landmark designated property. So I'm hoping that with more of these buildings becoming landmark designated, I'll be able to actually have authority to go on to these buildings because once they're landmark designated, they get put into in their designation, a, a, a phrase about archaeology. Um, the reality is that there really isn't a lot of archaeological preservation or, or restrictions and laws in Boston outside of the landmark district. And the only thing that really triggers um, my involvement is if it's city owned or if it's already landmark designated, there's a state archaeologist that works above me in Massachusetts, Brown Simon, that she gets triggered when you have properties that are funded by state or federal funding. But the realities are private owned land. I am not allowed to just walk on those buildings or tell somebody or tell the properties or tell them that they have to do archaeology because um, private laws are private laws. It's the United States, we have a lot of protections for private ownership. Um, however, uh, we've had some really amazing projects where owners have invited us onto our prop onto their properties. I get a lot of folks that want us to do archaeology on properties that are not theirs, but uh, developers or someone else's that say like, we need you to do archaeology. And I can ask them to let me do it, but if they say no, and I don't have those uh, landmark designations or state laws, I can't. I can't force myself onto the property, unfortunately. So, uh, so Mike, I want to acknowledge that you have a question in the Q and A. Um, we'll see if Joe can answer that one offline. I do want to read a couple of comments before we wrap up. Uh, Deb says, "I loved your book, A History of Boston and Fifty Artifacts, and can't wait wait to read the new one, which will be delivered early next week." Uh, David says, uh, "Thank you so much, Joe and Robert. Fantastic webinar as always." So, Joe, before we wrap up, do you have any last words you want to say to the group? Buy the book, please. Oh, wow. It's very dark where I am. I didn't realize this. Okay. Well, uh, so uh, on that note, uh, everyone who registered and is on the call today, uh, tonight will be getting an email from me tomorrow morning uh, with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please fill that out. Let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Uh, additionally, in that email, I will include uh, contact information uh, to the Tewksbury Historical Society and the Tewksbury Historical Commission. Uh, both those entities actually are kind of sort of unofficially headquartered here at the Tewksbury Library. Uh, they hold their monthly meetings here, although I think they're both sort of on COVID breaks at the moment. Uh, but I'll provide information um, uh, for both those organizations in the email tomorrow. Uh, I do believe they're looking for new members, uh, especially uh, young members. Um, uh, yeah, so with that, I want to thank you so much, Joe. Wonderful presentation. I want to thank the 50 plus people who were on the call. I want to apologize again for starting a few minutes late but I think uh, it turned out uh, to be a pretty wonderful presentation. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Joe. And everyone have a great night. Bye everyone, thanks so much. Bye, Joe. Bye.